the drama triangle. Uh, first of all, have any of you guys heard of this before? No? Okay. I hadn't either until just a few years ago. But then once I learned it, it uh, made sense of a lot of things that I struggled with before that. Struggled to teach or even struggled to figure out about myself. What is the drama triangle? It is a dysfunctional social game that keeps people stuck in victim consciousness. So it's important you understand that it's a game, right? Social game. Victim consciousness, or what I like to call victimism. I'm not sure victimism is a real word, but it is in my world. It's when life happens to you rather than being an active participant in making it happen. Okay. So victimism is when life happens to you. It's, it's when you think of yourself as an entity being acted upon. Okay. That's victimism. I can't help it. Somebody else did this to me. You know, I'm doomed because the society is doomed or kind of pointing to people on the other side of the aisle. That, and the thing about victimism that's really strange is it's, it's very comfortable to be in. People can tend to like feeling like a victim because it, it removes responsibility off their shoulders. When you're a victim, there's really nothing else to do. It kind of justifies you for not doing anything because, well, you can't. It's not on your shoulders. So that's that's kind of the underbelly of, of victimism is it kind of feels good because otherwise, why would anybody do it unless they get something out of it? When we understand the victim triangle, then we'll, we'll understand why, why we do what we do a little better. Imagine a line, a responsibility line. Everything above the responsibility line is, is healthy. It's a healthy way of thinking. Everything below the, the responsibility line is unhealthy. Or maybe unhealthy isn't even the most full way to say that. It could be immature also, because people under the responsibility line could just be children, right? You can't expect an eight-year-old to, to live above the responsibility line as far as being responsible for their own lives. So it could just be that they're on their way up towards that responsibility line. And by the time they become a young adult, they will cross that line and they'll be uh, responsible. But what I'm talking about now are those of us that are adults in age and body, but yet we're still living below the, the responsibility line because that is unhealthy and that's unhealthy with thinking. We're primarily talking about, you know, our, our emotional lives. Uh, we're not talking about other areas of responsibility. We're kind of thinking about our, um, our emotional responsibility, kind of our, our, our thoughts and our, the way we approach things. With the drama triangle, we're, we're going to look at uh, the triangle below the responsibility line. So if we go back to this, we're going to look at this red unhealthy triangle. Now, the important thing about the drama triangle is we need to realize that when we are living below this line or when we're behaving below this line, whether it be kind of all the time or, or just once in a while or most of the time, that we're playing a role. It does not define who we are. It doesn't mean that we are a horrible person, a bad person, a crazy person, uh, an ungrateful person, uh, or even really a truly a victim. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means it's a role that we play. Okay. And sometimes we like to play a role because it's just easier. It's defined. And so, and we see these roles being played out in our families, in our culture, we, we begin to identify these roles, you know, early in our lives. And we see other people playing them, you know, right in front of us, we see that somebody else plays one of these roles and they get a certain result. That comes from that. So then we learn, well, if I act that way, then I'll get that same result as well. Keep in mind that these are roles that will help you understand a little bit better too. Uh, it'll also help you understand that when you're playing a role and you, you are playing it, you can step into it and you can step out of it. It's not defining. It doesn't define who you are. You can step into it and we do sometimes without even knowing it, but we can consciously step out of it as well. That's why it's important to understand that it's a role. It's targeted towards leverage. Whether we want to believe this or not, every one of us, myself and every one of you, we all want control, right? And that's a battle. All we have to do is think back to our childhood of all the different battles and stages of life of control. You know, we want to have control because control is a form of certainty. When you don't have control, that's uncertainty. And that leads to uh, more anxiety, right? And so we want to live our lives kind of understanding what's going on and understanding what's going to happen. It, it turns into a little bit of a tug of war when we desire to gain uh, that control, as opposed to maybe backing off with the control and trusting other entities that it's going to be okay without having control. And that that's something that comes with maturity. The game is all about who gets to be the victim. Think of the word victim kind of in conjunction with leverage. If I'm the victim, then somebody owes me something. Poor me. I am this because of that. Somebody owes me something. There's kind of a debt to be paid back to me to get back to even or to a just place. So somebody owes me something. And so that leverage can be very, very valuable when you get to be 
the victim, people will look at me and they'll think, oh, he has something coming to him because he got the short end of the stick. And then sometimes we fall into that and we pity the victim. And then we think that we're helping them, but it actually gets worse. We'll see how this all plays out with these three rules. But just so that you know, in the center of this triangle, it's a it's a game. It's a contest to see who gets to be that victim. And you'll see how you'll kind of see how the race plays out to get to that here in a minute. All right. So let's look at the the first role. The first <laughs> role is the persecutor or uh, in some models, they might call it the villain. So the persecutor or the villain. And there are three types of persecutors or villains. The first is the powerful. Maybe they have got a lot of leverage and they, they're they going to point fingers and they're going to make sure that they use the power that they have. The second type is the know-it-all person that uh, uh, kind of has, has all the answers and it, they're not afraid to let everybody know when they're wrong, right? Because there's somehow you're a little bit more superior than, than the other person. So it's easier easy just to kind of let them know how wrong they are and how they need to think a little bit more like you because you're... You're a lot more logical and knowledgeable than they are. They've just got a lot of room to grow, right? And then, then the third is is truly the the accuser. And it's this would be a, a critical person, a person that really kind of uh, can't help but to point things out that people do wrong. They're always pointing a finger. They're blaming somebody. They're wherever they go. They're critical. They're they go out for dinner. They're critical of the food. They're critical of the waitress. They watch TV. They're critical of whatever political party is on the other side. Uh, they're critical of their family members. They just make accusations. The first role in the the drama triangle is the persecutor. They seek to assign blame. When there's a problem, they don't first look towards the solution. They look backwards towards the blame. A lot of times it's an us versus them mentality. They tend to be divisive. Um, it's your fault. See what you made me do. Uh, you know, what's wrong with you? Those are kind of the attitudes behind um, a persecutor. And the truth is, is we can all be a, a persecutor once in a while, right? But the difference is, is, is this our go-to? <laughs> when we when we have our on-ramp, you know, onto the drama triangle, is this it? You know, and so for some of us, it certainly can be. The second one here is the rescuer, or it can be called the hero. The rescuer uh, seeks temporary uh, relief to avoid bad feelings, and they seek value by being needed, and they hate conflict. Okay, they need to be needed. So this could be a person that maybe is a people pleaser. It's not just a people pleaser, but it could be. A people pleaser could be a hero. Somebody that wants to, uh, that gets something out of coming to the rescue for someone, or they can build leverage that way. Like, I'm gonna come do this for you, but then you'll owe me. And they're, they're quick to do that. They're quick to get out there and be, uh, be the hero and save somebody and come to their rescue. Uh, sometimes it's by enabling them. People that are enablers to somebody with an addiction, they can play the, the rescuer or the hero role. And they feel like by um, enabling them or, or eliminating their, their instant stress by um, appeasing them and kind of removing that discomfort, they can kind of feel like a hero. So the, the three types of rescuers are uh, the good guy, just kind of the good guy, the person that's uh, really not going to oppose anybody. They're just kind of always want to find favor in everybody and they'll do whatever they need to in order to find favor. The peacemaker, the person that might jump in between two people that might have a conflict and they'll put them at ease really because they don't like conflict. Even if the conflict could end up being something that's very useful in that case, they, they would rather see it just be peaceful because maybe it's anxiety, whatever the case. And then the savior uh, the person that really can come in and, and uh, rescue the situation for leverage. Some of the things they might say is, um, it's all my fault. It's not yours. You know, I'll take the blame for this. I'm only trying to help you. Look how hard I've tried. The rescuer and the hero can, they can also use a little bit of guilt and shame in this uh, in this race to who gets to be the big, biggest victim. So you can see how a rescuer or a hero could be uh, maybe proactively gaining some leverage up front by coming to the rescue for somebody, right? And then then they can say, well, look what I've done for you. Look at what all I've done for you. And you're really going to do this. You you owe me. So the third role here is the victim. The three types of victims would be the pathetic victim, which is woe is me. And they have pity parties. Eeyore is the character, you know, woe is me, pity parties. And so the pathetic victim has, has a sense of uh, helplessness in their mind. The, the truth is that they're not really helpless, but this helplessness serves them in the moment it helps them to gain some kind of leverage. Like you can gain something from helplessness because then you don't have to do it. Somebody else will come do it for you. 
right? So if you play the woe is me, then then maybe it'll save you the effort of having to, you know, leap across that responsibility line, roll up your sleeves and kind of get it done. Somebody else will just come do it for you. Uh, then there's the angry victim, right? Uses guilt and shame and virtue signaling. These are the people that might, you know, be protesting their victimness, right? They're loud and they're obnoxious and how dare you keep us down? We're, you know, we're the victims and you're, and then martyrs, uh, the emotional vampires, high drama, just in the workplace, the people that are just high drama, just their emotions are up and down and up and down. And, and man, it's a killer in the workplace, right? And so emotions can really play a part in uh, in this type of victim. And then there's also, there's there's passive aggressive victim victimhood as well. So maybe it's not like a, an emotional vampire. Maybe it's just kind of a, a stoic undercurrent of somebody that's kind of silent and withdrawn. That can also be a victim as well. So it looks a lot of different ways, but you know, the key is that there's a, there's an element of helpless, helplessness that is going on inside of their head, but then usually also comes out of their head and gets expressed somehow. Some of the the things that might come out of the mouth of the victim would be, I guess I just can't do anything right. Why are you yelling at me? Or nobody listens to me. Um, and and they're they're also at the effect of their circumstances and life is happening to them. These are these are the three roles. So you can kind of see what's at the middle of those two. So blame is is kind of the 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 weapon used for the persecutor. Uh, fear and anxiety is the central part of the rescuer, the hero. And then helplessness is the central point to the victim. Now that you kind of have an idea of these three roles, we all will play a role in this drama triangle from time to time. In fact, when we were young, we, when we were really young, we lived in this drama triangle, probably at least a lot of times of our lives. And the thing is, is we don't just play one role. We actually will play all three of the roles in this drama triangle. We'll play all three of them, but we'll all have a major role that they'll play. The one that that's kind of the on ramp into this triangle. That's pretty typical. That most of the time, it's it's one of these three that will be something will trigger trigger us in our life, and boom, we'll get right into the triangle and we'll come in under this primary role that we play, whatever it is. Sometimes it's help. Sometimes if the victim thing is then then that's your on ramp. Something will will be the cue that starts that, and then you there you go. You're in it. You're like poor me somebody else might, uh, their on-ramp into this triangle might be blame. They might just naturally just be a critical person. They just, they're fault finders. They just, it's really easy for them to do that. And when they see some kind of injustice or they see some, some, it could be a commercial on TV. It could be anything. It could be a sign, something that they read, whatever it is, just kind of triggers them and they just go into blame mode. Right. And then the other people, uh, the rescuers, the heroes, they, they're kind of driven by fear and anxiety. And so they see some kind of a conflict brewing up and then they, they just want to jump in and kind of smooth it all over. And, and so anytime that there's anxiety or fear or some kind of conflict, that's when they jump into that triangle to try to make that all go away, make that problem get solved. But we can, we can jump around and bounce around this triangle pretty regularly. In fact, if you think of pretty much most any argument that we have, maybe an argument with one other person, it starts with one person playing one role and the other playing the other role. Uh, probably most often would be one person is the persecutor and the other person is the victim um, or perceived victim and persecutor. So one person comes on, maybe somebody comes in the store and, and says, how come you're doing that that way? That's not the way it's supposed to be done. And the other person says, well, that's the only way I know how to do it. This is the best way. It's like, this is how I was taught. Well, you shouldn't be doing it that way. That's not right. We got to do things the right way. You should know that by now, right? And the helpless person or the victim's like, look, don't yell at me. It's not my fault. I didn't do this. But then, but then it can flip, right? Then the helpless per person can say, well, wait a minute. You're the one who trained me how to do this. And now the person that started the whole thing with the blame walking and saying, why did you do that? They're like, wait a minute. I didn't train you how to do this. This wasn't me. I would never train you. No, I, I know you did. See, so what the victim is, they flipped it around on them. They flipped it back to get the leverage. They flipped it back to blame the blamer so that the blamer now is the one that's the bad guy, not the one who was doing the thing wrong. Then the blamer, now that they're on their heels, now that they're the one that's actually doing the thing wrong, according to the other person, now they feel like they have to defend themselves. So now they take on the role of the, the victim, right? And then here comes the, the third person, you know, coming in like, hold on, guys, hold on, ch just chill out. Everything's good. I think it's fine that he does it this way. You know, and then boom, that now we got three people involved in this and they're bouncing around this triangle. So you can see within one minute of an argument, you know, you might pay, play all three different roles. <laughs> Any one person could, but you can certainly bounce back and forth between blame and helplessness as well. Now, the rescuer in here, the way that they can get involved, maybe from the very beginning, is 
they uh, spend a lot of time or money or effort helping somebody in a situation and they don't feel very appreciated because of all of all of the stuff that they've done for this person and the helpless person still isn't rising up above the responsibility line and the rescuer is getting tired of that, you know, and then they finally just kind of like, you know, I've been trying to help you. I've been trying to do all these things for you and you just don't seem to appreciate me at all. Why can't you just, you know, fill in the blank? And what's happened is, is that rescuer is actually creeping towards the persecutor now, right? So now they're kind of starting to get that because being the rescue, rescuer just kind of didn't get it done. The other person was still a victim or still, you know, not taking care of what they need to take care of. And so they creep up towards the blame game. And then there you go. And then you, you're, uh, you're back in the triangle. So do you guys understand? Can, can you kind of see how we bounce around from role to role and how easy it is to do so? In fact, it's almost impossible not to once you get into the drama triangle, because that's what it is. It's, it's like a ping pong match. I get to be the victim. No, then you get to be the victim. Then I get to be it. Then we, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the dynamics of, of the bouncing around. What do you guys think of that? Does that make sense to you? Is anybody able to see themselves in and all three of those roles? Mm -hmm. And even on a regular basis, we can all jump in that triangle on any given day. It's like a trap. Once it's a in, trap. Yeah. So how do you get out? How do you stay out of it? How do you stay out of it? Yeah. That's, that's where, well, staying out of it, first thing you get is recognize that you're in it. Yeah. I find myself up, it's like a go-to because like I said, when we're kids and we live there, so this is our comfort this is our comfort space, right? And so yep. now we're aware that this is a thing. It's like, oh, now I know I can do something, which means now I can control my destiny. I'm no longer, if life isn't happening to me, I'm going to happen to life and I'm going to control it. So this is this is where we go to. We're now going to go above the line of responsibility. Yep, yep. So I think I think the first step to that question that, that Sandy asked, so how do we get out of this? The first step to that, I think, is just to be able to identify it. Without knowing this stuff, if you're a victim and you you tend to go become a victim and think like a victim, you're thinking that way and you're justifying yourself for that because it just feels natural to you. That's just that's just what everybody does in your mind. That's, that might be what you're thinking. Well, that's just this is just what everybody does. But if you can identify this and realize, no, no, this is a role that we play. It's not who we are. It's just an exaggerated version of what our feelings are. Our, our feelings are always going to exaggerate the truth. When our mind, our brain tells us something isn't the way we would like it to be, our emotions can come in and exaggerate that and make it feel a lot worse than what it really is. Uh, and it can also uh, make it feel a lot more difficult to turn it around and make it be what you need it to be. And so it's an exaggerated role that you're playing in your mind. The first thing would be whether your role is the persecutor, the victim, or the rescuer, any of those three. The first thing is to be able to identify uh, when it's happening, you know, to be aware of it and, and to be able to identify when it's happening. One thing that I know that it's helped me a lot in this area to be able to identify it is to talk about it when I'm not in the triangle, when I can kind of be outside of the triangle, but look at myself and, and to ask myself, okay, when I go into victimhood, when, when I start to feel sorry for myself, what's the trigger that causes me to get there? What's the words that I tell myself? What, what are those words that, that represents how I feel? Is it, why are you always yelling at me? Is that what I think to myself? Or nobody listens to me or woe is me, you know, whatever it is. If you can decide ahead of time when you're not in the triangle that, hey, when I'm starting to think these things, that's my cue that helps me to identify that I'm in this role. And you, you'll be able to identify it then ahead of time. So now it'll just, it'll ring a bell and like, oh, I'm falling into this triangle now. Then, then because you, you know that, you can make a conscious decision to stay out of it, especially if you already decide ahead of time how you're going to react when that cue takes place. When I start to feel sorry for myself and I start to say, well, nobody loves me. When I think that, that's going to be a cue. And I'm going to tell myself, wait a minute, that's not true. And I need to step out of the triangle. I need to, to jump across that responsibility line and, and get up and start thinking clearly. Maybe that means going for a quick walk. Maybe that means kind of uh, pulling myself away and uh, taking a deep breath and whatever it is. But whatever we need, to do, we need to do, we have to figure out our own cue to get out of the triangle so that we don't stay there. So we'll talk about the upper triangle here. There's always going to be a choice. Whenever that cue comes a lot along, whatever that is, that cue comes along, somebody, um, somebody comes along and gives you some advice or criticism. And that's the thing that triggers you, that gets you down and gets you started, you know, being defensive. 
at that moment when that cue comes, we always have a choice. We can react to this and we can go straight to the to the drama triangle. Or if we know about this and we have these contingency plans in place, we can just make a choice not to. We can say, you know what? I'm not going there. You've all seen the the story of the, the person trying to pick a fight, right? You can either fall into the trap or you can say, look, you know what? I'm not doing this and walk away. Don't jump into the triangle. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to stay above the line. I'm going to take the high ground, so to, so to speak. And that's why they call it the high ground because it's higher. It's on, on the top side of the responsibility line. So there's always a choice whether we spend our lives above the responsibility line, which is the healthy side in this healthy triangle, or we spend more of our lives below the responsibility line or the unhealthy, just realize that it is your choice. It's not society's choice. It's not your boss's choice. It's not your spouse's choice. It's not your kids. It's not the president's choice or any political party. This is your choice. It's always our choice to live above this responsibility line. And, um, but we have to flip a paradigm, first of all. We think that when we rise above this line, all of our freedoms go away because now we have to act mature and be mature. We have to follow all of these rules and do these things. And being below the responsibility line, that seems to be freedom because, gosh, I can do anything I want to then. You can, you can do anything when you're irresponsible. But the truth is that when you get to the point where you've crossed this responsibility line, you realize that the opposite is true. When you live below the responsibility line, you have no freedom. You're just at the whim of whatever happens, right? But when you live above the responsibility line, now you are in control. You're, you're living in a way that you're driving, driving the boat then. Uh, to give you an example, there's a speed limit on every road, right? So let's say there's a 55 mile per hour speed limit on every road. If I want to be irresponsible, I have a lot of freedom. I can do anything I want to. I can drive 95 if I want to, if I just want to live below the responsibility line. In a sense, it feels like I have freedom. But the truth is, if I get caught, I lose my freedom. But if you want to keep your freedom, just drive below the speed limit and you'll never get arrested. You'll always have your freedom. And so that's how it works in life as well. And in relationships, it's the same way. Live according to the, this top triangle. You'll just have the freedom to enjoy relationships. But below that line, taking those shortcuts, the freedom to say what you want, to act how you want to, and to to blame and be a victim. Uh, this is just going to, it's going to enslave you because you're going to, you're going to go from one bad relationship to another, to another, to another. And if you live in, in the drama triangle in your workplace, you'll sabotage your, your relationships in your workplace and you'll move on to the next place where you work and you'll do the same thing. It'll just be a, a chain that, that follows you wherever you go. But when you live above the responsibility line, then you have opportunities. So let's, let's jump into this. Um, there is a healthy cycle. When a person who lives in the drama triangle, the unhealthy cycle, when they make the choice to exit the drama triangle and live according or above that responsibility line, they just come to a place in life. They're saying, you know what? I don't have any excuses anymore. It is my fault. I take full responsibility. Whatever happens going forward is going to be because of the choices that I make. I'm not controlled by the exterior world. I don't have to be triggered and fall into this. I can make those choices. What happens is we start to take on three new kind of roles instead of those uh, dysfunctional roles of the persecutor, the victim, and the rescuer. So when that happens, when we, when we rise above that line, the persecutor, the person that was living as a persecutor, they become the challenger or the motivator. They're still using their personality of assertiveness, which a persecutor would have, but they're doing it in a way that they're challenging and they're helping other person for their benefit. So really the difference is, is below the responsibility line is pointed towards self. Above the responsibility line is pointed towards other people. So you use your same giftedness that the persecutor would use to, uh, to persecute, but they're a challenger. I, I can tend to be a challenger. I like to challenge people. Um, so there was there was a, a part a little part of me that was a persecutor years ago before I was able to cross over this line. The victim, the person that played the victim role, well, they tend to be an overcomer when they cross the responsibility line. At one point, they were helpless, couldn't do anything, and then they rose above the line and said, "You know what? I can do something. I can have control, and I can uh, I can make my own choice of what happens." And th they become the overcomer. You know, when you when you come face to face with a person that's a true overcomer. Maybe it's a person that um, lost a limb uh, or is, is, uh, has a disability, or maybe a person that was uh, uh, assaulted, you know, maybe sexually assaulted. You know, there are a lot of uh, women that um, have been sexually abused and men 
that they will tell you, I am not a victim. This does not control me anymore. I am a winner and I overcame this. And they live above the responsibility line. They're not triggered any longer. They've dealt with it and they've moved on. And they've, uh, they're have they part of this health cycle now. And because of that, then they help other people through that too. Now, the person that's a rescuer, a person that's a people pleaser, uh, tends to be a person with, um, uh, it, it can tend to be a person with high empathy that uh, can be compassionate. So they use their gifts as a as the hero on the unhealthy cycle. But now, as a, after they cross that responsibility line, they become the nurturer or the healer. This might be a, a nurse or a, a therapist or somebody that's really good at putting their arms around people and saying, look, you know what? I understand. Let me, you know, I'm here for you. Let's, let's work through this together. And so they're using their superpowers that they were using for bad down below. Now they're using it for good up above. We also tend to bounce around this triangle as well. When you get above that line, you might be the challenger for one person, for another person, you might, you might be the overcomer. And you might be able to use that superpower to say, hey, look, you know what? You can do this. I did it. I know it's hard, but let's do this. Let's get this done, right? And then the healer, you know, the person that was down there, now they understand. They understand people a little bit better and they're doing it for them. They're not doing it to gain leverage. They're doing it genuinely to help this person get over their, their rough spots. I, I hope you all kind of understand how this responsibility line uh, plays the part in this and the three new roles. If you have more of a heart change and you you cross that responsibility line, it's not just a mental decision. It's actually a heart change. It's like, I'm going to look at that person different. I'm going to put their needs ahead of my own now. Um, I'm going to put the big picture uh, ahead of my own. And when you do that, those words will become more natural. Now you'll still have to think through them. And, and there really is a, uh, there really is a value in learning how to word things and running your scenario past other people that they might help you word things differently. And, you know, call up one of your peers and say, hey, look, I got a confrontation and can you help me with a better way to word things? Because here's how I would say it. And I don't think this is right. <laughs> I, I like, I really do like that idea of getting the words right so that it reflects the right role because that, that's how it will be received as well. Here's a, here's a better view also of the, of the roles of, of the leader, the three types of survivors, the problem solver, uh, the advocate and the creator. The creator would be somebody that is really good at problem solving. They problem solving. They can think outside the box. They're a source of strength and grace. The challenger, the three types, is the motivator, the inspirational, and the assertive uh, person that that can can give confidence and resolve. The nurturer is a you know the counselor, the teacher, the healer. They have compassion and empathy. Those are really really important roles that we have to play. Uh, every day as leaders, when we have people under us, we have to play these and we have to be able to bounce around these. Uh, some of these will become, uh, are, are, are not very natural to you to begin with. And then once you practice them, you just get better at them. Like the nurturer, you know, I can do that. I can do that now. It, it was hard for the longest time. That's the hardest one for me to, to embrace. But, you know, I, I learned how to do it by, by first of all, going and asking for advice and, and asking for how to word things from people who are naturally a nurturer. So I got to spend more time learning that. So now I can do that. It's not natural. Being a challenger, um, that's pretty natural for me. Being a survivor, that's fairly natural to me too. Uh, but um, anyway, these are the three new roles. And I think it's really important that we really see the difference in these, these six roles.